And we're now live for the bonus session today of uh, our virtual eTourism Summit 21 Days focused on winning in 2021. And uh, we had a great, uh, great session earlier and really, really looking forward to this bonus session. I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm here live in Orlando where uh, Connect Meetings is hosting our first post COVID. Um, post COVID meeting, about a thousand meeting planners and suppliers here uh, meeting safely, and it's been an exceptional event. So uh, we're gonna, we're learning a lot of lessons for the live and in person version of eTourism Summit, November 9th and tenth at uh, Universal Studios. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is again a um, a bonus session on, on a topic that I think is going to be of critical importance in 2021. And as we walk through the conversation over the course of the last 14 days. Uh, really building the the marketing planning. A lot of conversations about uh, targeting and and uh, audience identification. And I would have to say that uh, probably one of the most often um, impromptu mentioned businesses uh, that have come up in different conversations over the course of the month has been um, Conversant Epsilon. And many people, David, have. Uh, have done a very good job of explaining that it is now Epsilon, it was formerly Conversant. So oh. people are, uh, are very well familiar with both of those. So um, I wanna thank you so much for your continued support of eTourism Summit. Um, and clearly it's a, it's, a, it's a great partnership for us. We very much value it and appreciate it and are really looking forward to uh, this presentation today on, on what's happening in the world of, uh, uh, of our identity, identity and how we're able to uh, uh, target people moving forward. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, we'll come back. Uh, everybody that's on the line, I certainly encourage you to go to chat or Q&A and uh, ask any questions. When David's presentation is done, we'll come back and uh, make sure that we address all of those questions uh, that you have. So uh, let's uh, keep it keep it in, engaged and interactive. And with that, David, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks so much, Will. I really appreciate you tourism giving us this opportunity to talk to you all today. So thank you very much. I know it's three o'clock. Uh, on uh, Tuesday, so grab a coffee, grab uh, a quarantine cocktail, whatever you need, and we're going to dig into the exciting world of identity um, and how cookies are decaying and crumbling. Uh, but first, we'll show a quick video uh, as a reminder about who we are, um, and then we'll get back to it. Your goal is for more people to enjoy everything that your destination has to offer. So how do you drive more visits and prove your marketing was worth the money? It all happens with Conversant. Here's how it works. We know travelers. We know their travel plans, purchases, places they've been, and websites they visit, so you can identify the ones who are most likely to visit you. Then you can deliver personalized messages across all their devices that will inspire them to book a trip, all while protecting their privacy. After they visit you, you'll know what they bought across hotel, dining, entertainment, retail, and grocery categories with the most comprehensive purchase data in the industry. For instance, you want to build buzz around winter getaways to your state. We find people looking for a break from the cold and encourage them to choose your destination. During their stay, we measure how much they spend. You want your past visitors to book a repeat trip to your resort town. We find them on their devices and remind them what they loved about their first trip. Then we'll show you how they spend on vacation and how it boosted your local economy. You want to drive visits to your state over spring break. We find people planning to hit the road and give them reasons to make your destination one they can't miss. Even if they don't buy plane tickets or book a hotel room, we can still measure what they spend on their trip. After travelers see your ads, you'll know what worked with in-depth reports of your visitors and the net economic impact of their trip based on their actual transactions. So you'll see the return on your marketing investment. You'll know total number of visitors and top feeder markets with extensive visitor profiles. Put Conversant to work for you to inspire visits and prove that your marketing drove more visits than spend. Wonderful. I think Becca will be pulling up the presentation as well here in just a minute. Um, but in the meantime, you did see that uh, Conversant uh, is our old name. We've been around uh, for a while. We are now being rebranded at Epsilon. So we've been part of the Epsilon family now for, I think, going about five years. 
And we finally decided to roll it all underneath one umbrella. So you'll see us marking ourselves more and more as Epsilon moving forward. Uh, but do not in anywhere compare us to that tropical storm brewing out in the Atlantic. Uh, it's just a tragedy. We're now moving to the Greek alphabet. So Epsilon is the letter E. So what we talk about today is how the tourism landscape is changing, why identity matters, and the death of cookies. Now, the death of cookies really is a shameless marketing ploy to get you to turn in. Um, Third-party cookies are going away. There are still some useful uh, implications for first-party cookies. But the reality is, is that marketing as we know it is drastically changing. So to keep with the theme of tourism for these 21 days, helping prepare for 2021, next year is a crucial year for destinations to get their uh, identity house in order, understand how they'll maintain a persistent dialogue with their potential visitors moving forward. So a little um, background of who we are, if you're not familiar with us, um, Epsilon was originally was a, a recently acquired by Publicis last year. Uh, we now, our Epsilon core identity sits in the, the middle of the Publicis platform. Uh, but what we really bring, and one reason we've been acquired at Converse, once acquired by Epsilon, and then Epsilon acquired by Publicis, is our ability to drive business outcomes for our clients. So our uh, expertise spans not just uh, in tourism, uh, but really a lot in other travel verticals, CPG, financial services, automotive, but it all gears around driving outcomes for our clients. So when we decided to launch our tourism solution, our core concept was how do we drive business outcomes for destinations that make sense and are defensible? So today we're talking to our agenda will cover um, something that has occurred uh, kind of quietly uh, you know, during this COVID, we've all been focused on recovery and how to navigate this pandemic. Uh, but some major changes are coming for digital marketing. Um, the cookie is finally going to crumble. It has not really been a quick death, but we'll share how it's been a, a slow death for many years. Um, we'll talk about how we can pivot to identify and reach high value visitors, create demand at every stage of the visitor journey, uh, measure and prove your impact on your communities, and then we'll, we'll visit a couple of tourism boards in action. I hope we have a couple of questions. Um, we're also going to try to use all the functionality uh, of this platform. We'll ask a few polls. So I think we have our first poll question coming up. All right, we have a couple of responses. We can revisit it. So when it comes to first party versus third party cookies, um, there's a big difference. And what's really been fo the focus right now um, from the recent uh, Google Chrome updates and the IDA updates is the fact that third party cookies are, are being deprecated. Uh, they're going away. And a lot of vendors, particularly in the tourism space, um, you know, whether it's in travel in general, on how we communicate with people, uh, how we look at devices and segmentation, it's really dependent on third-party cookies. So what do these changes mean? So a couple of things to keep in mind when it looks at the differences. So I think at a minimum, and keep in mind, we also have a handout that you can download as well that talks about, goes into detail, third-party cookies and first-party cookies, what they're used for. When you think about third-party cookies, uh, keep in mind that these are set by domain and it's different from the site user. So this is going to be um, a true third-party cookie. It's going to not be associated with the site itself. It's used by advertisers and um, attribution vendors and other people to, to measure and, and see what people are doing. Uh, first-party cookies are set by the site itself. So look at this infographic. Um, a first-party cookie will appear just like the site being visited. Um, and it's used to remember items placed in carts, recently browsed information, remember log information of users, website analysis. And we utilize a lot of first-party cookies in our um, platform um, that we get directly from our published relationships. Third-party cookies are appear on a site, but they're used to typically look at a, a vendor uh, domain or another domain. Um, they're used for retargeting. Uh, they're usually quick image pixel-based. You can uh, manage ad frequency. A lot of us used to build reporting and website tools, frequency and purchases, user profiles. But the biggest challenge with third-party cookies is that they are not transparent. And as we've seen with some of the, it's funny to think back now, pre-COVID, to the headaches that 
GDPR and CCPA were, were havocing on the tourism industry. To start thinking about that third party cookies are going away, it's a, it's a big um, uh, reason to be behind some of those, those things. So it's really based around consumer privacy concerns and how we're going to adapt that. So I think I may have accidentally done the second poll at the same time. Um, but are you confident you're messaging the right people and measuring success on iOS devices? Uh, half the folks said no, 27% said I'm not sure, 17% said yes. So when I mentioned that cookies are dying, it really has been a very slow death. And it's been something that not a lot of people in tourism have been talking about. So web browsers, except for Chrome, uh, have pretty much eliminated third-party cookies. Uh, you cannot place a cookie in an app environment. Um, and then recently, most recently, Apple and their IADA updates, you're not going to be able to actually pass some device ID towards advertisers. So this all started back in September, so in uh, 2017. So when Apple released um, ITB 1.0 on Safari, it eliminated third-party cookies to prevent cross-site tracking. And then over subsequent versions, it changed to uh, further limit cross-site tracking. Um, and then Google announced that Chrome might start doing it. Mozilla followed suit to now that uh, in January 2020, Google announced that by 2022, third-party cookies will essentially cease to exist. Now, this has been a moving time frame for Google. They've revised this a couple times. But what it means to advertisers, if you don't have a firm grip on identity and be able to message people and see visitors and uh, utilize first-party data for your advertising campaigns, there's going to be a big void. Um, but it has not been something that uh, is coming slowly. It's been happening for a long time. And you've probably seen it. You know, Kind of an interesting note for us is and we'll get into how we do um, uh, our identity solution here in a little bit, but we've actually increased our inventory delivery on iOS devices since this happened by 25%. Um, not because we're spending more on it, but the reality is, is that less people, less programmatic vendors are actually bidding on iOS inventory. Publishers make less money on it. They can show less, less proof concepts. Uh, so there's more inventory up for grabs. Uh, so we've actually increased spend in iOS because we're able to see users across your devices and engage them. So why is this particularly challenging? Because they have been relied heavily in the digital advertising industry for years. I mean, it's been the, the essential workhorse since uh, people started looking at metrics beyond clicks um, uh, for, for digital advertising. So they rely heavily on third-party cookies traditionally for personalization of ads. So when you see, you go to browse on a website and that same thing you just looked at follows you around the internet forever, that's really based a lot on third-party cookies. Uh, Campaign manage management, some of our basic uh, media tools are based on the ability to place a third party pixel on a piece of creative or be able to get an, uh, a device ID easily passed to us. Um, that's changing. And then measuring performance. A lot of, of our attribution tools are still based around um, third party cookies and device IDs. And, and though those are good, there's, there's, there's things that people are pivoting to make sure we're ready for that. Um, it's going to present some challenges as we move into next year, especially during recovery, because for the first time, destinations do not have a lot of demand to just take advantage of. Um, there's not a, they're having to actually move into demand creation. And third-party cookies uh, are a quick, easy way to be finding certain audiences, but when that's gone, unless you're deeply rooted in the ability to target individual at scale, um, there are going to be a lot of limitations. So now what? So cookies are crumbling, they're going away. Um, a lot of, of digital vendors have quietly stopped running iOS. I mean, something that would be interesting to go look at, um, we encourage all our clients to do this, look at your um, paid media delivery and see what percentage actually appears on iOS devices versus a uh, uh, Android browser or Chrome browser. Um, a lot of times we'll see it being anywhere from 0% to 20%. And if you are running media on iOS and you're not using a vendor with a robust identity solution, uh, you're relying heavily on contextual targeting, which means we're buying a website, but we have no insight into who's actually on that. You're not gonna understand who that person is, what they're doing. You're just gonna know this person happens to be on a certain website. So we encourage you to look to partners who provide a stable and scalable ID graph with limited reliance on third-party cookies um, to really make sure we're, we're driving great impact during recovery. Explore tools that can help you better leverage your first party data you might have and transactional data. 
Uh, we'll talk more about business outcomes, but the goal is for destinations to hold themselves to ROI just like any other business. And then seek out partners uh, that have access to consented first party data. Um, one of the ways that we do that is we, um, to comply with all the price regulations, if someone were to opt out on our platform, we opt you out across all devices. Um, a lot of times when people opt out, they're opt out at the cookie level or device level. So making sure you have partners that truly respect privacy and can make sure they can still respect privacy and scale your campaigns. So we've talked about how cookies and they're crumbling and going away. Um, love to answer questions on that um, as we move forward. But now let's pivot quickly to, you know, what do we do now? You know, how do we identify and reach high value visitors? And we have many friends on this call and some folks who may have not talked to us before, but this is a movement we've seen in tourism for a long time. Um, I personally am relatively new. I mean, Epsilon really entered this space hard about three years ago at eTourism. Um, since then, we, we work with about 80 uh, VMO clients, uh, but we help them identify and reach high value visitors. What COVID has taught us, um, and we saw the industry headed this way, but um, this recent pandemic has really um, brought it to a head, is that talking about the volume of visitors we drive as a destination might be a losing proposition, especially in light of stakeholder sentiment. Um, we've always been battling how many people versus how our residents feeling. And it's a losing battle because at some point you have too many folks or it's uh, a lot of people are coming or you're holding yourself to just visitation numbers and it's hard to prove success year over year, time to time. But what if a DMO could hang their hat on? They're not going to reach every potential visitor. The budgets and scale just aren't there, but their expertise is better spent reaching your highest value visitors. Who can they drive that spends more than the average person of income anyway? And look at a high valuable visitor over time. So it starts with identity. So the accurate identity is the foundation for marketing. Um, we look at individualized profiles, understanding of every consumer. Uh, we'll get into a little more details in a second. Serving that user a personalized message. Now personalization, I've learned, can mean a lot of different things. It can mean just making sure we're serving mom the right ad, dad the right ad, the ski enthusiast the right ad, or it could mean actual personalized creative. So you're creating dynamic um, media for the individual based on their actual interest. And then measuring it, that every dollar spent should be spent to drive ROI and a measurable outcome. So this right now is the current identity landscape. And this is how you as individuals are tracked. Uh, you have device IDs. Every device you have has a unique ID attached associated with it. The average American right now is tracked across about 23 different cookies uh, from the websites you visit, from the um, advertisers that try to message you. You have PII. You have personal identifying information on you, your email address, your shipping address, your phone number. Uh, you have many different emails. You have your Gmail account, your work email, your, your fancy sports email, your junk email. Um, different customer IDs, different databases, that creates a real challenge for marketers, especially looking at things from incrementality to just understanding the reach of a potential audience. So the first step in identity solution is how do you reconcile all these disparate pieces into a single ID? So this is an example of, of, of just kind of put this in, in better perspective. Um, this was an actual client database that they gave us they said, we have 152 million cookies in our database. We did dupe that down to just 23 million individuals. They had so many disparate pieces. They thought they had 152 million people in a database, but it actually is only 23 million actual people. So once you can understand your actual scale, you can calculate things like conversion rates, understand the reach and frequency required to drive visitation, um, actually measure individual behavior, Go beyond just broad demographics to understand what types of people are willing to travel now. Um, and then engage this person across our devices. Stop ignoring iOS and really engage an individual in a way that makes them want to drive an outcome. Whether the outcome is buying a car, going on a cruise, buying an airplane ticket, or traveling to your destination. So what is our approach? And I think a lot of folks, when I've met with them in the last few years, have asked us to dig a little deeper so we're gonna do that in our next couple slides. So we've developed an anonymous ID, we call the core ID. 
And the core ID is founded on proprietary name and address data. So Epsilon, um, before they acquire Conversant, has, has a 50 year leader in um, name, address, email, database management. So you can have name and address data as proprietary. We see online and offline purchases from our partners and clients that's matched to this foundation. So everything we do is matched back to a real person's name and address, even though it's pseudonymized. And we augment this by other login registration data and other supplemental data signals. So this approach allows us to connect each core ID to a person's offline online identity. So when you look at the infographics, kind of small at the bottom, but each core ID is associated with a name and address and a purchase. So when we reach people on our platform for our destination clients, we're reaching people we know are verified by name and address as a real person, and they buy things and they purchase. And all that data feeds in this core ID. So uh, the anonymous name and address, your phone numbers, your email addresses, where you purchase, your device IDs, your connected TVs, everything, every impression point all rolls up to a single individual. And that's immensely important as we look at recovery and identifying people based on their proclivity to travel, uh, their interest, um, their willingness to get back out into the, in the community, um, and just seeing them at scale and understanding the size of the potential universe. So I know these are all uh, you know, digital folks on this call, so I'm gonna dig a one step deeper too in how people uh, do identity resolution across device. Um, these are terms you may or not may not be exposed to but the vast majority of, of traditional partners in, in this space rely heavily on a probabilistic model. Uh, a probabilistic model is making some implications saying that this data is associated with certain people and devices are matched based on IP address. So this desktop computer, uh, this iPhone, this tablet, they're all on the same IP address. That could be household. So you would see, you would treat mom, dad, kids, devices the same or it could be uh, your VPN at work, it could be your entire office building if you're on your work Wi-Fi, um, but it's a lot of uh, liberties um, and assumptions around just IP address. You have deterministic matching, which a lot of um, companies like Google and Facebook will do, is they have an email associated with an account and they match devices on their platforms that way. So uh, you know, this person logged into this phone, this person logged into this computer, our devices are matched. Um, there act there's actual partners out there that only really specialize in, um, in device matching. They usually do a hybrid approach. So it's usually IP plus email address. So it's, um, it's a, it's a little additional scale. What we do is a little unique. We take a deterministic model. So we look at that hard login data, but we verify it based off of purchases. So shipping address, billing address, all your emails. So we match devices that's persistent and it's scalable. We will understand this is the same user on their iPhone, uh, their tablet, their personal computer, their work computer, and see that person at scale to control reach and frequency, and ultimately the ideal messaging to drive the outcomes desired. So with this single view of Traveler, you can see all these different interaction points. Uh, this is a very busy circle, so we won't spend too much time on it, but if you look at the second ring, you'll see first party data, third party data, behavioral contextual. All these pieces are important, uh, the challenge in the current landscape is they're fragmented. We've taken all these pieces, consolidated into a single ID uh, to get actionable uh, results out of. Uh, where we work with someone like an automotive manufacturer or a cruise line or airline is they have robust first party data, the upper quadrant, or the upper, uh, upper piece of this um, circle here. So we see, uh, they'll say we have actual first name, last name, email, it's all anonymized. Uh, we, we match that to our unique anonymized device IDs or our user IDs, core IDs, and mess on their behalf. The challenge with destinations is there's no first party data. So what we've done is we've developed a proxy for that, an ability to, to help destinations who may not have databases actually get learnings from past visitor transactions in their markets and make actionable decisions to drive outcomes uh, for their community stakeholders. So how does this work? So we talk about how we match uh, consumer uh, to their online profiles. So step one for us to build these profiles is to match all your devices together. We then verify that person with that offline first name, last name, uh, all your email addresses, your purchases. We then see hundreds of days, not 30 day cookie segments, but hundreds of days of desktop and mobile um, browsing data, content consumption, uh, location data. 
Uh, that's the foundation of every profile we have. It's these first four pieces. For destinations now, we do something really unique. Um, so for this fifth piece is where if you were a, a travel brand, we'd ask you to supply some of your first party data to round out uh, this audience to really make it impactful for you. What we do for destinations, we look at two years of historic spend and we see about 60% of all US non-cash transactions in your zip codes. We then suppress your residence. As we've talked about, we, I, we understand people's shipping address, billing address. We know who lives in your destination. We suppress residence and we're left with visitor spend. Uh, we then know where those people from, what they look like over time, and we can either target them for quick win back strategies or model them to drive uh, new visitors to your destination based on those and the attributes that yield the most uh, revenue. So people who stay longer, shop more, spend more across our entire community, and contribute more to our tax bases can be the key proponent of who we're trying to reach. When you think about a, a retailer, uh, the same strategy applies. If you're a retail, you have a CRM database, you're targeting your, your best customers to try to drive incremental revenue. You have site retargeting that's activated. You're targeting people that hand raise and go to your website to drive additional revenue. And then you have prospecting. You're gonna look at people that look like your past customers that have a propensity hopefully to spend and drive them to come to your brand. Destinations can apply that same methodology. Target their past visitors, identify hand raisers based on travel intent and retargeting, and then acquire net new visitors to help their brand overcome and maintain or grow their share of vacation. So as we look at these people, we must look at everything they're doing. So we see who you are, what you're buying with online and offline, how you're consuming broadcast and digital, uh, where you're actually going, how you're interacting and where you're shopping. All this rounds out. And on the previous slide, we mentioned 200 million. Uh, is, that's the amount of people we see in the United States. We see about 18 million in Canada uh, and in other countries around the world. Those are people we have a core idea again. So we see, again, devices matched, verified by purchases. And to put a 200 million number in context, uh, the population of the United States is about 330, 340 million folks. Um, so whenever you see someone quote profiles, we have 500 million profiles, we have a billion profiles. I would always take a step back and let's put it in context of the actual population. If you're seeing uh, numbers higher than the population, those are cookies, devices, fragments, not all real people. So when we say we have 200 million folks, that is roughly about 88% of the online targetable adult population every single month. Uh, and you can verify that based off of, um, of your census data. So it's always important to understand your know, marketing one-on-one, what is our reach and frequency? Uh, so I think it's really important to understand your potential universe to uh, the consumers you can reach to drive the outcomes you want. So we'll pivot really quickly uh, into the travel market. So Epsilon has a, uh, a survey we do called Shopper's Voice. It's not travel specific. It actually applies to um, all consumers. Uh, we have asked uh, during this pandemic a couple of travel questions. Uh, this pool actually came um, from our end of July pools. So we're updating this now uh, for the fall. But we have some learnings I want to share. So of people who are eager to travel, this is back in the summer, you can see the generational breakout. Uh, you know, younger folks are wanting to travel. You know, it's not really anything um, too earth shattering. But as you look to these other trends, people are relying less and less on government direction on feeling safe when it's the book. Um, they want to know you have a plan in place. They want to understand the fact that um, there are safety protocols, but they're not relying on the state or federal government to give them a thumbs up saying it's safe to travel. Uh, people are willing to travel. Um, they're becoming more critical of, of what's going on as this pandemic drags out. Uh, and they seem to want to be getting out and visit, but not everybody. The second uh, or the third thing that we saw here, um, and this is a lot of numbers, you'll share this after you'll see it. But you go all the way to the end, 25% um, of people, there's nothing you could do to make them travel right now. Another 23% is on the fence. So as we move out of COVID or even trying to, to grapple with recovery, it's not even as much as who you're actually messaging, but it's who you're not going to message. There is no need, if you're trying to look for short-term revenue and hotel occupancy, 
to message people that are in no way going to travel. But unfortunately, uh, with traditional demo targeting, you know, we want to reach women, household income, 25, 54, kids in the home. Uh, you're going to get people that are not willing to travel. We're able to see people who um, are responding negatively to certain uh, advertising, who are not interested in traveling, who have said they're on these surveys, they're not interested in traveling. Um, but I think moving forward, it's more about who you suppress, you know, people that have certain conditions or uh, certain uh, leanings that was not uh, allow them to travel right now. Uh, you shouldn't be messaging them. So even more importantly now than ever is how do we minimize waste by taking what limited budgets we might have to make sure we're targeting just on the best people that will drive the biggest impact on our community that are actually willing to show up. So to our next point is how do we then pivot to demand creation? Uh, the travel industry has had a heck of a run. Uh, you know, we've seen it kind of go in, 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 in peaks and valleys, but there's been demand. Uh, people want to travel. Travel is a core tenet of who people are, how they identify themselves. Uh, they plan, they budget for vacations. They want to do it. But that demand has slowed. Um, where you could take demand of people want to come to Florida, they want to come and travel certain places, it's changed to how do I really change my destination concept? How do I make sure the great product that we developed as destination marketers, uh, people know about it? You know, it's less about there's just demand, they're going to Google you know, great vacations in a certain state and stumble upon us. It's more about how do we make sure we maintain our share of vacation and frankly, our competitive edge moving forward. Uh, destinations, what I've found uh, so the tourism is everybody's very collaborative. Everybody wants to help. Uh, we're all in this together, but we also need to make sure that we maintain our competitive advantage. We have to make sure that we're top of mind, that we don't lose our existing customer base to other destinations. So how do we create destination demand? Well, it starts about how you actually message an individual. So to go back to the, the cookie concept, if you're doing basic demo, third-party cookie-based targeting, this is what you're targeting. You're treating every single possible impression you bid on as the same. In this instance, they're male 35, married with kids, income 150K plus, live in New York. So they get the same ad, same messaging. We treat them like they're going to love our destination. Here's a beautiful imagery. Come to us now. But they really can be far from the truth. When you go down one layer where you get the first party data that comes in, you understand they're bargain hunters. Uh, they like luxury. Uh, they're loyal to certain airlines. They're not loyal to others. Um, they like golf. They like beach. They like skiing. So to be able to see someone and who they actually are allows you not just to serve them a message that drives the most impact, but also not target people who are just aren't a fit for your destination right now. Um, I think it's time to embrace that it's not going to be for everybody every single time. We have a lot to offer as destinations, but how do we find our core customers? And it starts with identifying who's been in the past, what they look like, how much money they spend, and creating models and audiences to make sure those people were coming back and that we can find more folks that look like them. And then use compelling creative, understanding um, you know, where they're going, and serving them ads and sequences based on what they're actually doing. Uh, we know if someone does not convert on mobile device ever, we're not going to convert on mobile device this time either. We understand how people like to interact, what times of day they interact, when they like to purchase, when they're most engaged. And you can make sure you're delivering media to drive that outcome. So now we've talked about how we create demand generation, kind of the nature of the travel industry right now, uh, the fact that there's some major changes coming uh, in the world of, of how uh, digital marketers can actually track consumers over time, uh, it's time to look at how this actually applies to our communities. So it's great that we can have all this, this targeting, but if we can't uh, communicate it to our, our shareholders, uh, does it really matter? So our goal now is to how do you measure and improve your impact on the community? And I, we've talked to this a lot of our clients on the call, we've talked to a lot of folks in the past, um, Generally, stakeholders and residents do not question that tourism is important for their economy. Um, a lot of times the scrutiny comes from 
what exact role did that destination and marketing organization play in that tourism journey? Uh, how we get that visitor there? You know, what is that direct investment? We spent $50,000. What did we actually get out of that? You know, it's not saying we drove all the tourists in the world to our destination. It's saying based on our marketing investment, what did we actually drive? Um, and it allows you to put dollars and cents against your, your efforts. So we want to prove that your digital investment drove ROI and impacted your communities. So the first step, we talked about it building at this point, is we define that right audience and feeder market and message them across all our devices. We then match those individuals to their transactions that they made in your market when they show up and measure that. So we're able to see user ABC123 was messaged in Atlanta, Georgia. They took a road trip down to that station in Florida and they spent this much money over there based on what we can measure. Now it's really important uh, to note for us, we do things a little differently. Uh, we don't extrapolate the data. Uh, we report back on exactly what we see. Uh, so here is 50 to 60% of the transactions these people made. Uh, you're able to model that more, uh, use other partners to tell a more complete story. But we thought it was really important to give a baseline of truth uh, to your visitors to really help you make meaningful decisions. So we'll walk through uh, some sample reporting. So uh, for this particular client, uh, you can see their marketing investment uh, over a certain time period. This is right before COVID hit. So they actually had a really short visitation window. Uh, you can see the return on investment. So a $79 to one return on investment. Now that encompasses everything. Not just hotels, that's restaurants, that's retail, uh, that's grocery purchases, vacation rentals. This is what these people spent on their measured non-cash transactions while they're on their vacation. This investment allows us to reach 9.2 million unique people and 27,000 showed up within 90 days or less. Uh, now this total visitors number is just the amount of people that actually made the purchase. So for example, if uh, mom gets served ad and dad doesn't, we'll see mom's purchases. Uh, moving into next year, we're gonna start looking at things at house level too. But right now this is all tied to the individual. Um, but what's really interesting is when you see the total visitors and the people you messaged, you then get a message travel rate, which is the conversion rate. So looking to budgets and you have visitor goals, visitation goals, once you understand your conversion rate, this is a good benchmark and goal to try to increase over time. You know, how do we get our conversion rate to increase, get more people to increase and then show up and market? Um, and then we get to the bottom uh, corner here, uh, you're actually able to see your average yield per visitor. So on average, now some people spend more, some less, uh, what did the person we message actually spend? Then our goal is over time to, you know, let's empower our DMOs to say, all right, here's our baseline, average visitor spend the destination, here's those we messaged, then we drive people to spend more. And that's a winning, um, that's a, it's a winning um, strategy uh, to make sure we're really telling a good story for our communities. So you can break this out even deeper. So, you know, a lot of our clients have used this to look at hotel ROAS. So we checked the box saying we're providing value to our hotel um, stakeholders. So in this example um, is a 33 to one return for um, hotels alone. Uh, we saw vacation rentals as well. This is more of a hotel destination. Uh, then you can see retail ROAS and dining and nightlife ROAS. This is important as we look at funding mechanisms. So, you know, I know um, people are presented here across the country. Uh, some have TIDs, some have other things they can use. Um, some destinations have passed uh, sales tax incentives to help fund tourism. Well, they've looked at restaurant taxes. Um, as, as I'm sure a byproduct of COVID, as we watched uh, funding take a major hit, is we look at alternative funding mechanisms. Uh, and you're able to now see the percent of visitors spend that's what sales tax that they're actually spending and collecting, what money is going to the general fund that tourism is not getting credit for directly, and be able to make the cases for maybe some alternative funding mechanisms. And then you can see uh, revenue by residential DMA. Uh, because we see people's address, um, we can message folks and, or just deliver media, let's say Atlanta DMA, and then see people that are residents of Atlanta, but also maybe residents of other places that were in Atlanta uh, for work or for travel or for business. We can also target people based on where they live. So if your goal is to, I want to target just residents of New York or just residents of Atlanta, uh, we can do that as well. Um, and we're able to see uh, what those residents do when they're messaged. 
and what DMAs perform the best in terms of yield and spend. Uh, so you're able to inform all your marketing decisions. If you're looking at spot cable or TV or print or magazine insert or billboards, you know, what markets drive the most value uh, from our economy? You know, who has a lower cost per acquisition uh, versus uh, other places? Is it cheaper to invest more in Chicago and Boston versus paying a premium for New York? So, you know, as you move forward and we look at um, making sure we invest our marketing dollars the best way possible, you know, understanding where people are actually coming from and how they're spending uh, is really important. You can see visitor demographics, uh, what do they actually convert, what they look like, and also you know, marital status and other good insights. Another good indicator of, of driving value is looking at visitor net worth. You know, as you're looking to, to utilize this data to other things, our clients have looked at ways to drive airport recovery, uh, you know, targeting specific customers to certain airlines in certain feeder markets to rebuild route demand. We've had clients utilize this solution to look at um, maintaining their snowbird population in the wintertime. We've had clients also look at using this um, uh, for their CARES Act funding to show that they're actually driving impact for their local community as well. Um, so when you think about spend and your role as destination uh, managers now or marketers, I think moving forward, we can think about um, how we can use the cost of an individual, how they transact, past visitors to make sure we're driving true ROI for our communities. Another interesting breakout for this uh, that we can show as well is spend by zip code. So as you're looking at um, economic development decisions, ways, where's places to invest in your community, um, did that new boardwalk pay off? Um, did this development pay off in this certain zip code? So really start using some of these insights too for city planning. It's funny, a lot of times, uh, especially while we're doing this regional travel, focusing really on um, drive markets, we're seeing places with outlet malls pop. We're seeing places um, that might have you know, a lot of shopping areas pop more uh, in terms of spend in restaurants over maybe the hotel districts. So we're able to capture hotels when you swipe the credit card and market. We also see what people spend everywhere else. So I'm going to end on a, on a couple of notes here. We'll have a little extra time for questions if there are any. Um, again, before I jump into this, encourage you to download the handout. Uh, we also have a new ebook uh, being published tomorrow. We'll shamelessly send links to about navigating in this COVID world in a cookie-less environment. Um, but here are a couple of tours and boards in action. Uh, some of these names are people you've probably seen. Uh, I mean, these are e-tourism favorites. <laughs> They're always on uh, presenting something. Uh, but for Savannah, uh, they were actually one of our first uh, clients. Um, we drove a 133 to 1 return on ad spend for them, um, mm -hmm. as well as, as a lodging row ads of 21 to 1. Uh, and Zeke says really nice things up top. Uh, for St. Pete Clearwater, uh, a similar story. 195 to one total return and 25 to one on lodging. Again, we can show the lodging tax we drove, but also the types of people, where they come from, and, and try to identify the best possible visitors uh, for your destination to drive meaningful uh, value over time. So some final thoughts, and again, thank you for joining me on this um, afternoon session. I uh, hope you've had another cup of coffee and maybe you made yourself a second quarantine cocktail. Um, but really ensure you have the right strategy in place. Um, every dollar invested should go towards marketing your destination and proving what you're doing works. Recognize the importance of your marketing investment, how it's driving community impact and economic growth. Um, and focus on maintaining your competitive advantage. I know we're all friends, uh, but it's really important now to maintain your share of vacation, especially as certain destinations open up certain times, your current visitors might be experiencing a new destination for the first time because you were not open yet or you had restrictions were not lifted yet. So it's important to re-engage your past visitor to tell them, hey, we're still here. Come see us when you're ready. We have safety protocols in place uh, and maintain your share of vacation. And then continue to understand every consumer in the tourism market and personalize your plans for your destination. Um, not every beach is the same, not every city is the same, not every mountain town is the same. It's important to understand what your core product is and find the people that resonate the most with that core product. And the best way to do that is to look at your actual past visitors, how they spend, 
and make decisions based on that. Um, so with that, I'm happy to entertain uh, some questions. Uh, a little early, which is great. Um, I know everybody is very busy, uh, but if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You all appear stunned, which is great. Um, one of the one of the questions that I um, that that I had coming out of that, and I and I've got several, but uh, we had a, a great presentation this morning talking about marketing the passion points, and I, I was just wondering. To how how granular you can get in terms of really specifically targeting kind of those passions or uh, you know the the niche audiences in the delivery of the messaging. Uh, you can get pretty granular. I mean, we've run some campaigns targeting brewery enthusiasts, um, certain cultural enthusiasts to try to get them to show and drive impact. But another thing to keep out too is is passion points are vital, but not but the passion points may not always be what's going to drive the most revenue. I think it's important too to make sure we maintain that balance is that we can drive the passion points. You can target those, those niche people. But I think it's also important to look at you know, how that's changed over time as well. And you know, as and what as a demo, what are we tasked with? Uh, we can message the passion points, drive them. We can also identify other markets. Maybe there's new passion points for a destination we didn't even know existed yet that we can capitalize on during recovery. Awesome. And um, watching cookies die and, you know, all this amazing data that you have, how does that how does that jive with all the new privacy laws? Is that does that work for you or against you or is it always changing? It, it, it works for us. It works against a lot of others, candidly. I mean, I think the, the privacy laws have been changing. Uh, a couple of things to note about what we do is that we are a privacy by design. So no client data, no first party data never enters our walls and everything we do is also opt out. So as I mentioned in some of the presentation is, you know, we offer that universal opt out, but it's not at the cookie level. It's at a user level. So if you want to opt out of advertising and being tracked, we think that's really important that you're right. And you can opt out, but across all devices, we'll pull you from everything and you won't be messaged um, at all. And I think what's important for destinations that are trying to think about how, um, you know, how these laws apply to them, um, I think you're gonna have to look for vendors that are doing it on your behalf, frankly. I mean, it's, it's a lot for a destination to try to build and, and handle on their own. All right. What well, you had talked a little bit about, um, you have the option to, to retarget folks or to model model people that have come and, and interacted with your site. How how is modeling the modeling changed kind of in COVID when it's, you know, it's not the lookalikes as much anymore. Now, you know, somebody could have the same exact kind of online profile as me, but they're had no intention of ever going out. Sure. And I think that's why it's just really important to look at that individual. Um, so the way it's, it's, it's changed is, and it also based on the destination, a lot of our clients, when they're starting to go back live the first time, they focus really heavily on their past visitors. They understand these are people that we know have been to this destination two, three, four times. They spend money. They're trying. If, they're, if you're like me, I have. I'm married. I have three small children. We're doing digital learning, cooped up in the house. As soon as Gulf Shores, Alabama, opened, they were the first ones. We packed the kids up. We went down and rented a house just to get away. Um, uh, my friends, similar situations, did not. Uh, we were wanting to get out and do something. But if you're messaging people like me, we know we've been to Gulf Shores. We know it's safe. We've been there before. We know what to expect. We're going to go back. So I think a lot of our clients embrace that they can go after their past visitors. Um, and then that model, uh, I think, is based off of those best visitors you've had. And you know, a lot of our clients, we haven't really modeled anything recently because the visitation numbers have been all across the board during COVID. Um, but it is going to be interesting to see how that visitor changes and who's showing up now. And early results have shown that it tends to be a younger audience, um, but heavy families. Lots of people with children are, are visiting and are traveling. And it's people, you know, frankly, a little bit of money um, and some job security as well. So it's also important to understand those who have the proclivity to travel because uh, not everybody, to your point, is going to want to get back out there. And, and then an, another kind of question on that on that same line, and just in terms of Epsilon's capability of, of this highly targeted, you know, uh, 
message delivery. Uh, it, it appears to me, and in a lot of the research that we're seeing um, recently, certainly, is that once you know people get outside of their home and go to a local attraction, they're more likely to take it at first regional or kind of drive trip. And once they've taken a drive trip, they're more likely to take a, a trip further. So you're able to then identify people that are showing those kind of predictable paths of, you know, venturing a little bit further out than, than they had in the past. Yeah, you can see people venturing out further, but you know, you can also see what people are actually spending. I mean, cruise lines, even though they're not cruising yet, they're looking at having really, I mean, all their earnings reports talking about they're having really um, promising bookings going into 2021. I mean, Ed Bash and Ed Delta just had an article um, talking about how a billion folks have traveled in the airline industry uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. So I think if you think about we're a bunch of penguins on an iceberg, right? All of, our, all of our destinations are kind of on this iceberg at the same time, waiting for a couple to fall off. They don't get eaten by a polar bear. <laughs> like we're going to keep, we're going to keep going and double down. I think people that take advantage of some of these flight markets sooner and later will help them rebuild their routes faster. And people are willing to fly. I mean, you're seeing folks, I mean, just look at your friends. I mean, they're going out to Wyoming and Montana. They're getting out and trying new things. I think people are flying. Um, you know, so we, we focus on the drive market, continue to focus on that. But I wouldn't discount people willing to travel further um, because the bookings, the airlines, some of the, some of the initial uh, earnings reports, as well as what we're seeing, so that people are also willing to travel longer distances as long as they can be ensured they can do it in a safe way. Absolutely. Um, and, and I've long been a believer of kind of, you know, yield versus you know pure raw numbers and this is this is something that you've been able to consistently deliver on over time my question for you is that uh it appears again from all the conversations we've had people are making a decision either you know for, for in the week for the week or they're making it you know starting to make plans for six months down the road and are, are you able to capture both the near-term kind of booking and the the longer term booking as well on on, on your campaign data so we actually we look at less of the booking it's more at the person actually showing up and spending money so right. you if you were to be served an ad uh, we will we will capture your data within 90 days so when i see this person showed up in 90 days and it was messaged and they showed up and spent money anything past 90 days is custom we typically look at 90 days as a good benchmark for showing up um but we're seeing immediate impact i mean some of our, our clients that went live we gave them their first reports that came live in june and july they saw strong numbers uh towards the end of the summer and beginning of fall because they're able to message people and tell them they were open and people showed up. So we were able to, so we had a lot of that really quick within a month and a couple of weeks showing up to spending money. We also have folks that waited, you know, six to eight weeks to actually show up. Um, what's interesting now is it's so regional is that you have some people in school, some folks not in school. I think you're going to have a stronger winter than people plan on everywhere. You just have so many people that are pent up and they have, they have the flexibility to take their kids to go learn somewhere else. Um, for a week, I think there's an opportunity to, to recapture uh, more leisure business, even though we've lost um, you know, some of the, the standard you know, business to business, Monday through Thursday business. Okay, one, one final question for you, and that's on the, you're solving an issue that has long been a challenge for destination marketers, and that's obviously proving the, the real ROI spend. And how, have you had, um, clearly the data that you're presenting is pretty, pretty well demonstrates that, you know, you, you spend a dollar, you're going to get more than a dollar back in sales tax revenue. And I think any time you're able to, to that was just one line I'd add in to your uh, to reports, right? I mean, if, if yeah. I'm saying here's a sales tax dollar, you, you, government money is getting more money in taxes than they're, they're putting into this campaign it would be a really powerful metric. But um, case studies in terms of people that have uh, been able to take that data back and really start to demonstrate to their local political uh, leaders that this is this is winning and and to support the, the DMO. Yeah, sure. So we, we have a case studies on our website. Um, I think if there's a, a you can click out after this, and you can see case studies from our friends in Franklin, Tennessee, Omaha, Nebraska, um, Savannah, St. Pete, Clearwater, um, and others. And we have other cases we worked on right now. Um, but everybody's seeing you know, strong results and they're able to use that to impact your campaigns. And it really, really, really will. It's one of those things I, not to, yeah, you know, e-tourism is a big part of this. I mean, that's one of the things I, I know as a, as a vendor, but really has. We met some really smart people here about three years ago 
and, and they have embraced it and they've doubled down and they continue to invest because they're seeing that, that, uh, that meaningful uh, results for their destinations. So a little plug in there as well. <laughs> sure, we, sure glad we got you detours in three years yeah. ago, uh, back in the conversant days. And now that we're at Epsilon, I can't tell you how much we appreciate and value your uh, continued support. And we will be uh, back together in person November 9th and 10th this year as part of our hybrid event. And then who knows what next year looks like, but we're going to be uh, e-tourism summit. We'll, we'll survive this. And, uh, and I think we'll be, we'll come out of this stronger than ever, but it's only thanks to uh, amazing uh, partners like you. So thanks again for your time. It's amazing how fast an hour flies. Um, and I, again, I really appreciate it and wish you, wish you the best and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye everybody. All right. Take care.